Hi, it's Dwyer, keeping it free, .blogspot.com. Let's do a hypothetical. Let's say I'm in my neighborhood. I want to protect property values. I want to make sure people are safe. And let's say that I harbor racist beliefs or racist assumptions that white people, in particular, young white men wearing hoodies, are violent. They're the burglars in the neighborhood. They have no business being in the neighborhood. If I see one of them roaming around, I know my sister, I know my wife is at risk. They're no good. Let's say my beliefs are completely unreasonable. Let's say that I wanted to be a cop but couldn't quite be a cop, but let's say I myself am a little bit unbalanced, right? Now just pretend for a second that while I'm in my neighborhood, heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko is out doing road work preparing for a fight. Let's say he's wearing a hoodie. All I see is a white man in a hoodie, right? Now he might be just in the neighborhood trying to, you know, log some miles, you know, do some road work. But as far as I'm concerned, this big man is a threat to me and my family, right? No matter how unreasonable or obviously racist that thought is. Now let's say that I, after making some calls, right? Because I want the cops to know, hey, we're under siege here in the neighborhood. White man wearing a hoodie, right? After making some calls, let's say I know that I'm armed. So I, of course, stalk Vladimir Klitschko. Let's say, you know, he's running in a circle around some place he sees me creeping up on him. I'm unnerving him. He's looking around thinking, man, what's going on with this? Right? This guy's coming up. This guy might even look like he has a gun, right? Maybe I'm coming up and I have my hand in my pocket or something. Right? Now, if Vladimir Klitschko defends himself, right? If I come up to Vladimir Klitschko aggressively, and I, you know, threaten him somehow, right? Now, keep in mind, he'd be out minding his own business unbothered, not bothering anybody if I'm not in the picture. But because I'm in the picture, right, he's now suddenly getting stalked. So let's say I come up to Vladimir Klitschko and I agitate him into defending himself. Now, if Vladimir Klitschko, because he's a better fighter than me, gets the upper hand, in other words, we're duking it out, and of course, he ends up on top of me because his punches might be a little bit harder than mine, right? His athleticism might be a little bit better than my athleticism. Let's say he's on top of me. Is there ever a time in that confrontation where Vladimir Klitschko isn't defending himself, right? If, if I agitate someone with better fighting skills than me and they defend themselves and we end up fighting and they get the upper hand, aren't they still acting in self-defense? You know, let me go another step further, right? We know from MMA that sometimes the guy on the ground actually is on the ground by design. Let's say I'm out hunting white people. Let's say I'm in the neighborhood and I'm a racist and um, you know I see Vladimir Klitschko come through and some other white guy at some time in the past did me wrong and I'm bitter so bitter that without even knowing Vladimir Klitschko I'm calling him a punk and stuff like that um, on the phone with police right just imagine I'm hunting white people just imagine that I'm there really trying to cause a scene right I see a guy minding his own business I say hey you know make my day you know I'm gonna force this guy to do something stupid after all I'm carrying a gun for a reason Right? If Vladimir Klitschko turns around and comes at me and we start scuffling, 
If I'm there to kill somebody, wouldn't I go to the ground? Wouldn't I have it look like the other guy put me on the ground? You know, wouldn't I take the gun out, kill the guy, and then claim self-defense? So, here's the thing with the George Zimmerman trial. You know, based on the entire defense presentation, we really can't say that George Zimmerman is an innocent bystander. We can't. Right? Now, who knows whether the prosecution met their legal burden of proof. I agree that the facts are hazy. Right? I could see this case being a case where jurors think something's wrong, but don't think it's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a possibility. I'm not here accusing anyone of being a racist in any way, shape, or form. But let's get real. We know something was wrong. Right? We know George Zimmerman initiated it. And quite frankly, we'll never know his state of mind. Because his defense team has chosen not to have him take the stand. So all we have is a guy who's cleaned himself up for trial trying to look as jury friendly as possible with some tale about how some black man attacked him and how he feared for his life and how he had to use deadly force. Think about it. I can be out there getting my ass beat. You know, I could be out there getting beaten up. There's a big difference between me getting beaten up and me having my life at risk, right? Trayvon Martin was a teenager. Let's get serious. You know, a plausible explanation for this entire thing is that George Zimmerman was stalking Trayvon Martin. And then when Trayvon defended himself, George Zimmerman took out a gun and shot him to death, right? Based on the facts that I'm seeing, Nothing changes that, right? The head injury, the nose problem. I can attack a person. They can fight back. I can get the head injury. I can get the nose problem, right? While they're defending themselves. I understand that there's a stand your ground law and stuff like that. I'm sure the state legislators <laughs> did not intend this law to be used where the person using it actually stalked the murder victim. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for George Zimmerman. I think we're getting a dog and pony show in the press. I do listen to shows like Mark Levin. I think it's a great show on the radio. I know many people have very strong opinions. I know there's a sentiment out there that this case should never have gone to trial. Right? Fair enough. But all I can say is, the defense's presentation, in my opinion, was not persuasive. It would have been enlightening to have George Zimmerman on the stand explain exactly where he was standing and where Trayvon was standing when Trayvon started fighting back. Right? Curiously, the defense didn't even believe that that was worth presenting. I know in these cases, many people say, hey, the defendant should never take the stand, right? You don't want the jury, you know, watching him and then reading things into his testimony that they shouldn't. But in this case, where only one guy survived, right? I really feel that Zimmerman owed it to all of us to tell us, number one, why he called Trayvon and other black people punks in his telephone call to the cops. Number two, you know, how did he end up getting close enough to Trayvon Martin for there to actually be an altercation? I understand there are different versions going around. Of course, the legally convenient one is to claim that after he followed Trayvon, he stopped following Trayvon. He was leaning someplace minding his business and then got attacked 
by a black teenager who, of course, he had been stalking, right? That sounds a little bit too legally convenient to me. Doesn't sound convincing. I'm surprised Zimmerman didn't try to flesh it out from the stand. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at keepingitfree.blogspot.com. Let me just say, and black, 7777.blogspot.com. Let me just say this. I don't believe this Trayvon Martin incident would ever have happened if George Zimmerman didn't stalk him, right? For me now to hear that George Zimmerman killed him in self-defense sounds like a racist stalking someone and then claiming self-defense when the person defends themselves and that racist takes out a gun and shoots them, right? This case doesn't smell right. Let me hear from you. Thanks for watching.